So I'm graduating next month and I think it's time we had a catch up. How am I graduating? I feel like a baby. <laughs> this has been the quickest and most intense four years of my life. Today I'm answering all your juicy questions on everything from graduation to living in Taipei to relationships and friendship and life. I've really missed you and I've missed just casual chats like this where I feel like we're friends having a little natter. So please grab a little tea, get cozy and let's catch up. So I asked you guys over on my Instagram, what do you want to know about my life? And I think Neela really summed it up when she said everything basically, <laughs> which is fair because there's a lot, there's, there's a lot. I think I'm going to start from these two questions from Vera and Fanny. Vera said, I've lost track. Can you sum up what and where you studied over the last few years? And Fanny said, I'm new to your account. So could you please introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, I can. So my name's Jade. I am from the UK, from just outside London in a little small town with loads of nature. I grew up there my whole life with the same kind of circles of people. My mum is from the Netherlands. My dad is from the UK. And maybe you know me from my study tube videos because I made a lot of videos during my GCSEs and A-levels about studying and trying to help other students who are really stressed about revision, especially because I didn't have an older sibling. My parents didn't go to uni and so I just was a very stressed student and wished that I'd had advice from other people who had been through the system and could just help me out. Or maybe you know me from getting rejected from my top university choice, Oxford. We don't talk about her. But basically after that whole journey, I ended up going to this relatively new university called Minerva. I found it during my gap year in a time where I felt incredibly lost and unsure of what I wanted to do in my future life. I felt like I wanted more out of university than the traditional UK experience, but I didn't really know what that could look like or if that was even a possibility for me, like financially, opportunity wise. And then I ended up finding Minerva where you study in seven countries across the degree. They're ambitiously trying to redesign higher education around the science of learning and active learning. And effectively I took a risk in going to this scam-like university and I had thousands of comments being like, Jade, you're making the worst decision of your whole life. But after four years, I am proud to say I think it was the best decision of my life, actually. I studied in six predefined countries. I was meant to also study in Hyderabad in India, but because of COVID, I couldn't go. And I studied with the same cohort of about 160 students from over 45 countries. I'm the only one from the UK in my cohort, so I really have been surrounded by international nationalism for the last four years. I studied a liberal arts degree, which is more under the US system. So I studied cognitive science, which is effectively brain science. And I did a minor in business. And I also did some electives for fun in philosophy and politics. It has been such a roller coaster. I have been more academically challenged than I've ever been in my life. I have been more socially and personally challenged than I've ever been in my life. I've effectively been dropped in all these cities, learned to make a home within this brand new, very different culture. And just as I feel comfortable in life there, I get ripped out and I'm made to do it again. But yeah, that's the overview. I'm about to graduate, so. Let's get into the juicy questions. Okay, the question I wanna start with is, how are you doing? Did you eat? Honestly, you are so inspiring. Thank you. I love the question, did you eat? Because this is such an East Asian thing. Like rather than saying, oh, hi, or how are you? Especially old people will be like, did you eat today? Like, have you eaten yet? Or have you eaten rice today? And I think that's so cute and comforting. It's like, oh yeah, I have eaten. Thank you for caring. <laughs> today I am good. If I'm honest, I feel a little bit tired and hectic. I'm about to start my period. We love her. And I don't know about you, but I can really tell where I am within my menstrual cycle. Like my entire energy, sense of self, ability to overthink changes across the month. And so today I feel kind of emotional, kind of low, but it's all, it's all good, we're here. But I also feel so deeply grateful for my life at the moment. I've been staying with a friend in my last few days of Taipei and tomorrow, Tomorrow, I am flying to San Francisco to graduate, which is insane. And life is so fast at the moment, but also I'm trying so hard to slow it down because I'm just enjoying it all so much. Someone recently asked me if you could either have a remote control which would let you pause your life or a remote control which would let you rewind, what would you choose and why? And I said pause 
because I've recently been living a lot of moments that I would really love to live within for longer. I don't necessarily need to go back to them because I think that's the power of nostalgia is like longing for moments that you've had. Um, but if I could prolong them right now, I would. Okay, so I've kind of split this Q&A into sections. I'm gonna talk a bit about Taipei. I'm gonna talk about graduation and my fears and all of that. I'm gonna talk a bit more about love and life and reflections and all that good stuff. So, Taipei. How did your semester in Taipei end up being? I know initially you didn't wanna go. Such a good question. So if you followed me at the start of this year, you would know I didn't wanna to come to Taipei. It was nothing about Taipei. It was just the fact that I have done this five or six times now, you know? Like the whole uprooting life, the brand new culture, like massive shift of absolutely everything in my world. And at Christmas, I went through some really tough stuff, mentally, personally, family-wise. Yeah, and I was just in a really dark place. I had no desire to like set New Year's resolutions or do any of these things. I had no desire to like start a brand new life somewhere else again. And I almost didn't go. And so I came into Taipei with almost no expectations and this city held me in the best way. This has been by far one of my favorite semesters, if not like top two. Guys, Taiwan is so underrated. This city is so peaceful. It is such a wonderful mix of being like, you know, a very vibrant, very diverse city, but with so much tropical greenery woven into the city in a way that truly feels natural. In every single park, you have old people doing Tai Chi, doing sword fighting, doing meditation and yoga, like spirituality and balance is built into the way of life here. I don't feel hustle culture in the way that I felt in Seoul, in London. It's just amazing. Like this country is just amazing. People are so kind, so warm. I don't know how much you know about Taiwan, but it's also a very democratic country. They were the first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. It's generally very liberal with a lot of subcultures and hip music, underground scenes. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I could, I would even imagine living here, honestly. I also worked on my thesis so much in Buenos Aires that I didn't have too much work this semester. I really tried to be methodical and just split up the work a little bit every week. So I didn't have this awful final push that a lot of people had in that last semester. Yeah, it's been great. Ooh, good question. Did you learn Chinese Mandarin during your time in Taipei? Apart from the odd few words like xie xie, which means thank you, or like, no meat, please. <laughs> um, no, I did not, unfortunately. But I did learn the language of every other city that I lived in during Minerva. I learned Korean for a year before going to Seoul. I learned Spanish and German for Buenos Aires and Germany. The way that I learned Spanish and German was a way that I wish I could have learned Chinese. Like I just absolutely adore this method. I don't know if you ever heard of Lingoda, but that kindly the sponsor of today's video. They are life-changing if you wanna learn a language. Lingoda runs two-month learning sprint challenges where you pick a language from German, French, Spanish, English or business English. And then you have a class every day or every other day for two months. There's small online group classes with a native speaking teacher. They're super flexible. You can book them any time of day, which for busy university students like me is so essential. You just go on the platform, you book a time, book a class. And it's also really flexible depending on your learning level. Like I could easily drop back into learning German at the level that now suits me. And guys, you just learn so quickly when you're having to speak, you're having to interact within the language. You're not just, you know, like on an app trying to learn vocabulary and then never using it. And it enriched my experiences so much. I remember even when I was in Berlin, my roommate wanted to pick up a package. She went to the pickup location. They only spoke German. They refused to speak English. And she was having such a hard time getting her packet. And so she's like, Jay, can you come with me and like try and translate and try and communicate? And I was so scared, obviously, but I went and I did it. And I was shocked how much I understood and was able to communicate and like sort out this problem. It makes you feel like you belong in a place when you can communicate. If you're looking to reach new heights in whatever language you're learning, I cannot recommend Lingoda enough. It helps you stay motivated and reach your goal and you can even get a discount. If you click the link below and use the code SPRINTJADE, you can get 20 euros or $25 off. And if you complete all the classes, you get all your cash back, which is insane. So many of my friends did it and didn't miss a single class and got fully refunded and basically learned a language for free. So I highly recommend it. As always, big thank you to Lingoda for sponsoring today's video. They're just the best and so supportive. 
supportive of this channel. We love them. Someone asked, what is the most memorable moment you had in Taipei? I actually have a really clear moment already because I did some reflections yesterday. So this was one of them. So me and my roommate Fong, who I literally adore, she's one of my best friends. We went on a trip, just the two of us, to Sun Moon Lake. This lake, firstly it has the most gorgeous name, Sun Moon Lake. Come on, it's beautiful, it's in nature. The sun was shining for our entire trip. You could cycle, you could get food and just ponder your life by the water. And me and Fong had this one night where just as the sun was setting, we went down and we sat by the lake and we brought our journals. For my birthday, she made me an album of photos of us. And so we sat and we looked through them and kind of reminisced our memories. And then we put on my late night road trip vibe Spotify playlist and sat and journaled for an hour and just really reflected on how we were feeling and the state of ourselves within this semester and what this semester has meant for us. And there was something so intimate about the companionable silence of being with her and just both of us, you know, very deep within ourselves reflecting and then sharing our thoughts. And for me in that moment, I just felt such peace in my life. And I was writing how this is the kind of friendship I want. I want this exact feeling I have right here. That was a very memorable moment. Now we're on to the tea that you want. Graduation. <laughs> I'm not even kidding when I say 60% of the questions were about what are you doing after uni? How are you feeling about uni? Are you scared? Are you uncertain? <laughs> Does graduating scare you or are you excited? I would be lying if I told you I'm not scared. I am terrified. I know a lot of people by the time that they need to leave university or high school, genuinely feel excited and ready to leave. I am not one of those people. I absolutely adore the bubble of university. I love learning, I love being a student, I adore my friends. And even though this Minerva thing has been so crazy, I have loved living in so many places and exploring with friends. I really feel like I've lived my dream life in many ways. And yeah, I just feel terrified because I don't have a clear plan, unlike a lot of other friends. I don't have my bougie bank job in New York. I'm unfortunately not gonna sell my soul to investment banking in Canary Wharf. <laughs> it just feels like the end of an era. I know I'm not gonna live in the same place, maybe even in the same country as most of my friends. With my degree, because it's a US institution, we get a one or three year visa for the US. And so technically I could go work in SF or New York. And most of my friends will be living in the US, especially those from countries where the currency is less valuable. It makes so much sense to help pay off loans, to be earning in dollars. But I thankfully don't have the same financial pressure to go earn in dollars. Like earning in euros or pounds would be equally as valuable. And right now I really am craving a bit of home. I'm craving a bit of stability. I really miss my parents. I think the older you get, the more aware you become of your loved one's mortality and time feels ever more precious. And I've really not been that present in my loved one's lives uh, for the last four years. So yeah, right now I'm planning straight after graduation to go home for at least a few months. And while almost all of my friends have gotten jobs or graduate plans, master's degrees, PhDs. I've almost intentionally not. I don't wanna to move to New York right now. This degree has been so much, so, so much. And I feel like I've not had the chance to process all these lives that I've lived. And I really feel like I need almost a mourning period of who I was during my degree. I don't feel like I can build a new life right now. I feel like I need to process these lives I've lived in order to then build. So I just wanna be in my hometown. I wanna stay at home, which I know is a luxury to be able to just like go home and live with your family. Um, but that's my plan, at least for the near future. And at least in my circles, I think there is a big stigma around not knowing what you wanna do and choosing not to jump straight into work. But I also understand that it's a sign of privilege, right? Because a lot of people would also love to go home and can't for various reasons or have extreme pressure to start working straight away. And I do have a source of income through YouTube. But yeah, in terms of plans for career, which I've had so many questions on, my dream life situation right now is to do YouTube part-time and then to do something else also part-time, which I don't have to choose just for financial gain, but is something truly 
impactful. Right now I'm most interested in the spaces of education and climate. I did a huge deep dive into ed tech during Buenos Aires, calling so many founders and talking to startups, trying to understand more about the ed tech scene in the UK and the US. I was speaking to a lot of product managers, trying to understand if that role was for me. I'm also really passionate about changing the education system. I just think it needs to change. And my degree is focused a lot on the cognitive science of learning and bridging the gap between what we know about learning and the way that school systems are run. So that's an area of interest. But increasingly, I feel like I should be contributing to the space of climate awareness, climate crisis prevention. Because we have such a short window, like guys, it's actually scary thinking about how much climate change is gonna affect us all within the next 10 years and how much it's already affecting people, especially in the global south, black and brown communities. Like this is an issue that needs to be solved. And I know some wonderful founders, storytellers, policy advocates in the climate space. And yeah, I'm thinking about maybe doing something there. Basically I'm open and I'm trying to see my life as full of opportunity and exciting possibility rather than being scared about the fact that I have nothing right now. Because the more that I adopt this scarcity mindset, the less incredible things come into my life. The more I say there is no opportunity for me, the more that I internalize that, then the less things I will find because I'm not looking through this lens of, wow, the world is abundant. So I'm trying to adopt that lens. As long as I live authentically by what I want to achieve in this world, do in this world, the fact that I want to take time for myself to rest and really move from a place of intentionality in my career, I believe good things will come. I believe I'll end up in the right space. So yeah, that is kind of a wishy-washy way of saying that I have absolutely no idea and I'm terrified. <laughs> If you have graduated, please give me advice. I'm so scared to lose all my friends and to lose my sense of purpose in life. And like post-graduation depression, I've heard is a thing and I don't want her. Do you have a graduation ceremony? I do. So I'm actually flying to San Francisco tomorrow for a one month intense graduation month which is overkill right a month the first two weeks we have thesis defenses we meet experts from our industry and have to defend our thesis we have to teach classes based on our thesis we still get graded so it's like oh stressful but then the final two weeks is like the ceremony the reflections my parents are gonna fly to sf so i can't wait oh asking the real questions do you think a Minerva degree has the same employability as other uni degrees? I think every single student in my university has had the crippling fear that no, it probably has a worse employability than more legitimate degrees. Even though we're accredited, you know, we don't have the reputation that say Oxbridge has. But I am so glad I can prove that hypothesis wrong. I am in awe of alumni and my friends and their future prospects. I have friends doing postgrad degrees in Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Columbia. So our degree is recognized, yay. I have friends going to work at McKinsey, JP Morgan, doing LPCs in law, going on to do medicine. I have so many friends who are going on to be software engineers in various startups, in Meta, in Google. We're a very tech focused university. So a lot of people go on to do tech stuff. We have friends in policy, a friend working at IBM. I have friends who are filmmakers. Oh my God, someone is an assistant director at National Geographic. Like basically, I'm not scared. This degree equips people with life skills and a way to think differently. So I think we have a, a bit more of a challenge to sell our degree to make people understand it, but I'm not scared in terms of employability. I believe we're valuable. <laughs> What do you think you will miss most when you leave Taiwan and other countries that you've stayed in? Friends and this phase of life, the student phase of life, where I am just learning all the time and my, my job, my full-time role is to learn, to have intellectual discussions, to be really curious, to sit with friends and reflect on our learnings about ourselves. And even though I believe you can do that in future life, in adult life, I just know that the structure of our days will change a lot and give people less freedom. So yeah, that's what I'll miss. Oh, what do you do to process change? I write a lot. I think writing is my biggest coping mechanism. I am such a journaler. After every chapter of life, every semester, I ask myself a lot of reflection questions. In what area of life did I grow the most? Do I have any regrets? Favorite memories? And that helps me process it for sure. This video is so long, oh my God. <laughs> ah, there's so many sections left. Such a good question. 
What would you tell little Jade who got rejected from Oxford now that you're done with your degree? Jade, you don't know this yet, but this is the best thing that's ever happened to you. Mourn the loss of it, feel the loss of it, but also understand that this universe has incredible things ready for you that you just can't see yet. And in four or five years, you're gonna look back and realize just how much you've grown and also just how much you've unlearned that maybe Oxford wouldn't have allowed you to unlearn in terms of attaching your sense of self-worth to academic excellence. You're happy, you're content and you're thriving. That's all you need to know. What do you wanna to say to all those people that thought Minerva was a bad idea to attend? I get it, I really get it. Like fully, fully agree to be honest at that time, reading the website looked fake. But I would also say, if you ever feel gut feeling that it's worth taking a risk for something, dare yourself to try. The worst thing that could have happened to me is I waste a year of my life trying a university that, okay, doesn't end up that good. Maybe I lose some money. That's all right, you have to do that sometimes in life. But yeah, I would also say about Minerva. So Minerva is expensive. It is expensive. If you come from the UK, Minerva is like, an like unfathomable amount of money. If you come from the US, it's considered very cheap. But with accommodation, city experiences, all of this stuff, it adds up to like 25K a year. But what I would note is that 90% of students are on very high financial aid, scholarships and work study. So I know almost no one who pays that full amount. Like financial aid is so generous at our uni. So please consider if you think that Minerva could be for you in terms of how I financed it. So I have a part scholarship and a loan, but also I paid for everything myself through YouTube, which is insane. I feel very fortunate that this financial burden didn't have to fall on my family. I basically got to invest in my own education through the help of you guys and this platform. So thank you so much for supporting me genuinely. So many more good questions, so little time. How has your definition of friendship changed through the years? I believe friendships work in concentric circles and friends are always moving between these circles. Sometimes you have people who are this close, some people you have, you know, more at the periphery and based on context, based on similar lifestyles, life bringing you together, people will shift in and out. Like starting a long distance friendship with someone might push them slightly to the periphery. That's okay, it doesn't mean that they're any less close because the next time you meet they'll collapse back into this inner circle. I also believe friends can serve different purposes and that's amazing. You can have friends who you go clubbing with, friends who you reflect on life with, friends who you talk about business, career, plans, more topical discussion. But for me, my absolute core friends, I think I've noticed three main qualities that I look for. Firstly is mutual effort. We are led to believe that friendship should be effortless and I do not think that that is true. Especially in adulthood, friendship takes time, energy, planning. It's choosing to call, it's choosing to put a recurring meeting in your calendar and sticking to it. And within this, it's a commitment to keeping this person up to date on big things that happen in your life. So for example, if I have a life update, it is up to me to put in the effort to inform all the people I view in this closest circle of that life update and I expect that they'll do the same with me. That is the perception of closeness. Second is that they're a safe space and I don't ever feel judged and I just feel like I can be vulnerable with them, they can be vulnerable with me, that is friendship. And thirdly is that we both receive mutual value in whatever way that looks like. So as I said, friends can have different purposes but I think both people should be feeling like they grow within this relationship for whatever reason. So yeah, that's friendship. Someone also asked, how do you intend to keep in contact with all your friends? Firstly is talk about expectations. I'm about to enter a long distance friendship with most of my friends. And I think it's really important to understand what long distance friendship means to me and what it means to them. Does that mean calling once a month? Does it mean never calling and agreeing to meet up in person once a year? Does it mean texting every few days? What do you expect? What do I expect? And how can we compromise? Because I think if you don't have that conversation really tangibly, someone will always feel sad and forgotten and that's how the friendship dies. <laughs> so talking about it, then I absolutely love recurring calls. So putting in your Google Calendar once every two weeks to have an hour catch up or doing things like book clubs and reading the same books so that we can discuss them. One of my friends is creating a newsletter where she's gonna update us on her life every month. So there's different strategies, but it really depends on the person and you and being as realistic as possible so the expectations are properly set. Such a lovely question. What is your relationship with your body like right now? I don't think about my body 
in the best way. I love my body. Like I just feel so truly comfortable with my skin more than I ever have in my whole life. I'll wear what I like. In Berlin, I went to a naked sauna, guys. I'm British. That's not something we British people do, but it was the first time that I felt like I desexualized bodies in my mind and just realized that we all, we all have bodies. They all look different. They don't look like the bodies we see in adverts. That's cool, that's fine. We all have stretch marks. We all have like funny little things about our body that we're insecure about and we should just embrace it. And we're all so gorgeous and the way we take up space so differently is something that should be celebrated. And the more you feel that your body is your home, your place within this world, the easier, the better your life becomes. I really know what it's like to feel insecure about your body. I've really been there. Um, but yeah, if you're struggling, just keep committing to healing. And one day someone will ask you a question about it and you'll realize that you don't even really think about it anymore. I have at least 20 questions that I wanted to answer in this video still. One other absolutely massive theme of my life has been love, relationships and sexuality, but it's not something I want to squeeze into a five, 10 minute video. So I'm going to be really annoying and say that I'm going to talk about that in a future video. I'm sorry, don't come for me. It's a big, big theme of my growth and life. But yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. My casual magic today was going to buy a soy milk from my favorite soy milk breakfast place and I've been there so frequently that the woman just recognizes me and has memorized my order and so she got me my soy milk tea with no sugar and just her smile and energy made me feel so good. If you watched to this point please share with me some kind of mundane moment of your day that felt magic to you for whatever reason. It can be the taste of your tea, it can be the way that the light comes into the room, just share with me a moment from your day. And if you share it with some kind of plant emoji, I will do my best to reply to you. Thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.